Welcome to the Not in the Job Description podcast. I'm Scott McLaughlin. And I'm Chris Kiernan. No matter what type of job you've had, there were situations that happened to you during work that you couldn't wait to tell your friends about. We interview a variety of guests about some of their crazy stories from work, from entry-level food service industry jobs to doctors and attorneys. We will explore funny, gross, embarrassing, scary, and sometimes almost unbelievable stories that people have experienced while on the job. Keep in mind that our guests or the companies they work for may be masked in order to protect the innocent, or maybe even the guilty. On today's show, we talk about horrible bosses. How's it going, Chris? Great. How are you? I'm doing well. And by the way, when I say horrible bosses, I'm not talking about the movies with Jason Bateman, who's one of the greatest actors of our time. I'm talking about just horrible bosses you've run into over time or heard about. Chris, have you had a lot of experiences with horrible bosses? You know, I've been pretty lucky. I, I can't really think of any direct horrible bosses that I've had. Now, I, were, I was in industries like a grocery store that cycled through managers, you know, pretty frequently. So um, maybe the, the bad ones kind of weeded themselves out and got moved on before I had any real bad experiences with them. Yeah, I, I actually have a little theory on this. I think that um, the lens of time kind of takes what that horrible boss was and kind of smooths it out over time. Because I can tell you, when I look back on the bosses that I've had in the past, probably when I was really young and I thought they were horrible, after you get through managing people yourself and making your own mistakes, you realize, eh, maybe they weren't that bad. But that's just <laughs> my take on it. I can tell you, you know, mostly I also have been very fortunate in my professional career. You, you kind of see that there are certainly different things that drive people to act certain ways. Uh, but most of the time, I think people have been pretty decent and I've been very, very lucky in my professional career. But I'll be honest, there were a few, couple sketchy situations when I was younger. I can imagine that I might have even been lumped into the horrible boss category myself. When I did work <laughs> at that grocery store, I was a young guy, right, early 20s, managing 16 and 17-year-old cashiers and baggers, and I'm sure they thought I was the biggest jerk ever when I made them go clear the lot in the pouring down rain, but hey, man, someone had to do it, and it wasn't going to be me. So Yeah, right. Sometimes it is tough, you know, again, things need to get done, that's and right. that's what your job is sometimes. I can tell you it was funny. Um, we've talked a, a little bit about some of the jobs we've had, but when I was in high school, I worked for a guy who owned a vending company, and as a part of this vending business, he also owned a gift shop at a hotel, and I worked at this gift shop at the hotel, and it was weird because – it wasn't even a part of the hotel. It was completely separately owned. But that, that just kind of let me work there alone with no supervision because this was a one-person operation. He would sometimes just stop in and, you know, make sure that we weren't asleep. And I'll never forget, I don't think this makes him a horrible boss, but he did a few things that, that were a little sketchy. Number one, uh, he would hire all the pretty girls from our high school and pay them a dollar fifty more per hour, and that pissed me and my friend Jim <laughs> off so bad because you know they're not working anymore. In fact, we were the ones that had all the worst schedules, so it was a little creepy that this guy was always uh, hiring in the, the pretty girls and paying them more money. But the one thing that I remember specifically is he would come in because he owned this vending machine, or he owned this vending company. And he would come in with like boxes of stuff for you to put out, candy bars, snacks, things like that. And I always wondered, like, did this stuff just come from, you know, some vending machine in a dark alley somewhere where stuff's about to go stale? <laughs> and so I'm putting out what's left. Well, he, he pretty much showed me that it came from something darker than a dark alley with a vending machine. He comes in, he sets up this box, and he starts throwing these Snickers bars on the counter. And he goes, I want you to put these out. I said, okay. And I looked and they had the Olympics logo on them for, for some, uh, you know, advertisement, but it didn't seem like the current Olympics. <laughs> <laughs> so I look at this thing and it was from the Olympics four years prior. Oh, geez. This thing had been, I mean, it, it had to have been three years expired. And I said, this guy's first name is Bob. I said, Hey Bob, um, I think these are a little old. He goes, what do you mean? It's the Olympics. And I go, yeah, but this is from the Olympics four years ago. And he looked at me and goes, 
You think people will notice? <laughs> I said, it doesn't matter whether people are going to notice. This stuff's old. You don't want to sell this. And he was like, I'd put them out. Right. And I go, okay, Bob, I'm not putting this out. And he was like, whatever. And he just left them on the counter. So I threw them away. But he was more than content to right. go, ah, buyer beware. <laughs> when you think they probably have been melted and then, you know, reformed again over the years, I'm sure they were not very tasty, right? Oh, pretty, <laughs> pretty nasty. Um, but again, if it, it, when you talk about horrible bosses, uh, that, that guy had a lot of positive things as well, but there were some chinks in the armor. Oh yeah, for, for sure. sure. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, as we were kind of looking for some stories here and I'm, I'm out there and I'm kind of searching around on the internet and you, a lot of common themes as far as you know, sexist bosses or maybe um, trying to pick up or hit on girls. And I found this. This was actually from um, a Cosmopolitan online article, um, not from my own personal magazine stock, of course, but it was it was <laughs> online. Um, sure. Right. W- one of the readers kind of had, had written in and said um, that she one time walked into her boss's office to find him shirtless. She says, when I ran back to my desk in shock, he proceeded to do a fashion show of different jeans and asked me how they made his goods look. <laughs> oh, God. If they were too tight or too loose. So I can't imagine she stayed at that job for very long after that. Man, I only hope that that was Cosmopolitan from 1980 because I can't imagine somebody doing that anytime. Right. You know, I mean, it was dated 2014, but even oh. then, but even then, I mean, you know, people, that's crazy. You would think they knew better by, by that point. Yeah. I mean, I think from the sexist point of view, um, and maybe this is just from my lens, but I'm pretty glad to see like when I look at old movies and stuff and you see the stuff that goes on you're like oh my god why would somebody put up with that but if it was even half as bad as what it was like in the movies before we got in the professional career that's horrible oh yeah for sure horrible for sure. I did a little research as well and uh, I found something from CBS News and I just thought this was a great story and this person said uh, I work part time in a lumber yard which had theft losses Aha, said management, it must be our thieving employees. Well, polygraph tests were ordered for every employee. I flatly refused to take the test. Since I was the leading salesperson, I was threatened but not fired. A week later, during a routine late-night drive-by by the police, they caught the thief loading a truck with material from the yard. It was the VP who had ordered the lie detector tests. <laughs> He did the classic deflection, right? He was doing it. was trying to blame it on everybody else. Yeah, and telling people, I will find out who did this. Right, right. And a bunch of people said no. And think about it. If anybody was going to be okay with people not taking the lie detector test, it had to be that VP because that leaves the shadow of doubt out there. Right, right. <laughs> Pretty smart. Um, I know, you know, I've worked in financial industry, and I haven't had any bosses, at least that I'm aware of, you know, if HR is involved in some kind of investigation, they normally don't put it on the news, but I'm not aware of any, any big thievery issues, at least in my background. Yeah, same here. Um, and, you know, I, again, I did work at that grocery store and we counted a lot of money every night. That was one of my jobs there was, you know, kind of balancing out the, the cash register. And from time to time, you maybe have a register that'd be exactly $20 short. Right. So... You know, maybe use sticky fingers, but sometimes it's just these kids don't count right, right? And they just give yeah. Well, I mean, this money back. This does kind of remind me of we have a mutual friend that um, years and years ago we worked at a large retailer together. And <clears throat> granted, we've done some wild things when we were kids. And when I say worked at this retailer, we worked in the mall and at this retail company. We couldn't have been twenty years old. And I'll never forget that. He got taken off the floor and they said that he stole from the till. And, you know, once once we were outside of this area, I was like, hey, man, uh, did, did, did something go on that you get caught? And he looked me right in the eye and said, listen, we've done a lot of goofy things growing up. I'm telling you as straight as I can be, I have never taken a dime from this company. So, you know, I kind of believed him because it, it was very plausible that he was like, yeah, so I took 20 bucks. But he didn't. Right, he, right. he just said, nope, never. Wasn't me. So this thing turned into like this big legal thing where the management was going after him. And well, to make a long, already long story short, uh, they found out that it wasn't our friend that did it. It was the security people that said they caught him. So... <laughs> When it was all said and done, they found out that there's about four people that were working 
the mall security and they found out that they had uh, not only taken money from the till and were blaming employees, but every time they caught shoplifters, they would take them in the back and, you know, give them, you know, their beat down over what all did you steal? And then they would take all the other stuff that they stole from the mall and take it back out into the mall and return it for cash. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> so they were enterprising. You know? right, I right. give an A plus for that. So maybe that's more of a horrible employee story, right? We'll have to. Yeah, that'll have to be a future episode for sure. So any other uh, research you've done where you have found some stories that kind of talk to you about what a real horrible boss is? Yeah, you know, there there was obviously a lot of stories about when people have babies and um, maybe they were requested to come back to work too soon, you know, for the mother or the father, you know, saying, hey, my wife went to labor. And then the boss is like, well, how soon can you get back to work? But the one that really kind of stood out to me, this was off of Quora.com. This was an anonymous um, submission, so I'm not sure really who says this here. But basically, um, the the guy said that his wife worked for the government and her best work friend had um, an eye issue from birth, a degenerative type of eye thing from birth. And she'd been on this transplant, transplant list for years, 10, 15 years. So she finally gets the call. Um, that she's going to, um, you know, her time is up. But they give you very little notice. She's like, next week. Right. You know? So she basically tells her work that, um, hey, I'm going to have to be off next week for this eye transplant, of all things. Not just like I'm going to the doctor, but an actual eye transplant. Um, and so this was, when she tells her boss, this was his actual response. Um, we're actually fairly busy next week. Could you reschedule that for later <laughs> in the year? What if I need that report? I, I don't think I can let you have next week off. Oh, wow. I mean, that's about as bad as it comes, I think. <laughs> well, you know, a- as we're telling these stories about medical situations, especially about things like, you know, they they don't have a reschedule button, right? Right. I might be a horrible boss. And and, and believe me, this, this sat with me for a while when it first happened. But there's a f- she's a friend now. But at the time, we worked together, and I happened to just get promoted, so... I was her manager and and this happens all the time, but you know, I was her manager and she was pregnant and you know, I am somebody who will go to work. I don't care if I have scarlet fever. I'm one of these people that's like, look, the work's got to get done, be it good or bad. So I would always go to work. uh, And I think people saw that. And I think it sent a message that sometimes isn't a good message. So you can, you can go a little too far with that stuff. And I, in early in my career, I certainly did. Well, this lady, Jen, who is now a friend of mine, she came into my office and she goes, she actually scheduled a time, which was weird. So there was time scheduled. She comes into my office. She shuts the door. She sits down. She goes, I was hoping that I could talk with you. Um, You know, it's very formal. And I go, yeah, why? What's up? She goes, hang on. I'll be right back. She gets up and leaves. And she doesn't come back for like 15 minutes. And she said, hey, I just wanted to tell you um, my water just broke. (laughs) And I was like, oh, you're kidding. And she goes, no, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm going to leave now. It's not like an emergency. And I said, well, you were wanting to meet with me. Was there anything like really important? Are you good? And she was like, no, no, I'm good. Believe it or not. I was actually coming in. I was really worried to talk to you about it, but I was hoping to take some time off with my pregnancy. And I thought, oh my God, she felt like this needed to be a big conversation. That was one of those eye-opening experiences where maybe she's on another podcast right now going, I just had to set up a meeting for this guy and my water broke right there in his office. So maybe I'm the horrible boss. Right. You should just use the phrase, uh, we'll plan better next time, Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, we're busy that week. Sorry. (laughs) Now, I did a little bit more research as well. Um, In fact, we're going to talk about a lot of uh, funny stories that we've read because uh, I'm very thankful, and from the sounds of it, Chris is too, we don't have a lot of personal horrible, horrible boss stories, but we do have quite a few. And also from CBS News, I thought this was funny. Uh, Someone said, I had a job working at a summer camp during college. I had worked at this camp for five summers. This particular summer, my best friend unexpectedly died from heart failure, and I took a leave to go to the funeral. When I returned, my grandfather was on his deathbed, and my mother asked me to request more time off. Obviously upset, I approached my boss and explained the situation. And my boss said, well, you're just going to have to get over it and get on with your life. I can't let you go again. (laughs) Oh, man. <laughs> this person then goes on to say, my grandfather died the next week. And when I told my boss, she said, you should have planned better. You don't even have any bereavement time left. 
<laughs> so again, that's horrible. Planning for bereavement time. Right. Right. Yeah. As uh, if it were that easy. Right. Exactly. One that I saw on, on Cosmo uh, again on that same uh, article there. Um, that was kind of funny. Was um, they said that um, my boss used to tell me and another coworker he hadn't showered in days and wanted us to make sure clients didn't get too close to him at events. <laughs> that's awful. Right. That is awful. So hopefully that's not the lead by example that you were referring to earlier, right? I mean, I'm sure you still showered every day. Right? <laughs> <laughs> well, at least every other. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, you know, thinking of that bereavement story, it, it reminded me again where this whole time I think I am the horrible boss. Um, this is something that came up years and years and years ago. But um, when I was working at this company, I was relatively new to the uh, to the kind of area that I was going to. And one of my, they were called team leads came up to me and said, uh, Hey, um, I've got this person that just moved from you know this other team to mine and they seem to be missing a lot of work. And I'm like, Oh, okay. Well, you know, what have that has it not been addressed? And they go, no, no, it's, it's been addressed, but, um, they have a lot of bereavement days. And I was like, well, that's awful. It's horrible. If that's happened, she said, uh, no, they've had 26 bereavement days in five months. Whoa. Yeah. So I called this person in, and you can tell very quickly, he's just kind of a, a character. He's kind of a bullshit artist, uh, real smooth talker, uh, very, somebody you'd want to hang around all the time because he's very entertaining, but you wouldn't trust him as far as you threw him. And I said, you know, hey, man, um, is, is everything okay? And he said, yeah, yeah, why? What's up? I said, I was looking at your attendance file, and I'm going to be blunt. Um, there were units in Vietnam that didn't lose this many people. <laughs> <laughs> and so, of course, it gets around that I was stupid and said something like that. And he was like, yeah, it's, it's, been, it's been rough, man. It's been rough. And I said, you, you want to tell me what's happening with your family? Like, is something going on 26 days in like five months? And then he explained to me, uh, well, you know, I run a church, and when I say one of my sisters died, and I said, listen, dude, <laughs> you, you can't do this kind of shit again. It, it has to be your blood relative sister. It can't be a neighbor that's you're close to that's your sister. Because he was taken off like, you know, four and five days because he said somebody in his church died. Right, right. Pretty classic, but I might be that bad boss once again with my <laughs> Vietnam comment. Well, and they always find a way to, you know, these employees that, that maybe push the envelope in their mind, they always think they got the best excuse for when they're um, confronted on it. Right. Oh yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So you're right. I didn't really have a lot of horrible boss experiences personally. My oldest daughter, however, she did have a kind of a, a bad experience. Um, when she was in high school, we kind of push our kids to get, you know, that after school job. Um, and her first after school job was at a local movie theater and she loved that job, but they closed down. So she just goes into work one day and they're like, sorry, we're closed. They got bought out by a competing theater. So they were closing. And, um, and that was that. So she, um, finds this other job at an area restaurant and it wasn't fast food. It was, you know, like a sit down type of restaurant. So she gets a job as, um, as a hostess there, or actually as a server. So during orientation, they give her this piece of paper. They say, here's your schedule for the week. After this first week, you'll be in the system. You'll be on the schedule. But here's what we want you to work this week. So she's like, okay, no problem. The next day, she gets a call from a different manager saying, hey, um, you were supposed to be in today. Why aren't you here? So she freaks out. She gets ready. Unfortunately, the restaurant's like two minutes from our house. Right. So she gets there at no time flat. She goes and she goes, oh, I'm sorry. She goes, here's the paper they gave me. And they told me that these are the hours I'm working this week. And this manager said, well, I'm actually the manager that does the schedule. So you need to look at the schedule, not pieces of paper that are handed to you. And she's like, OK, I understand. I'm sorry. I just I didn't know. Right. A lesson learned. Right. So she goes on break. So she goes to check the official schedule now to see how it lines up because she'd already arranged her week based on this piece of paper. Well, she sees she's scheduled the next day at 2.30. Well, she didn't get out of school till three o'clock. <laughs> she so, should have planned better. Right. <laughs> well, so she says to this manager, she goes, yeah, um, you have me scheduled at 2.30. I'm going to be late. I will get here about 3.15 from school. 
And the lady goes, you know, that's going to be an occurrence. And during your probationary period, you really don't want to rack up a lot oh of my occurrences. God. So now she's just beside herself. So then the, the last part to this job is she, a few shifts later, she's working her first closing shift. And this exact same manager, um, it's about a half hour before closing, and she pulls Hannah aside. She goes, hey, now's the time that you should start your pre-closing routine. And Hannah goes, great. Um, it's my first closing shift. If you tell me what to do, I, I'm, I'm on it. I'll do it. And this manager was basically like, um, what do you mean you don't know what, what to do? It was like super sarcastic, just berating her for not knowing what to do. Oh, gosh. And my daughter's almost in tears because she's like, I, I would do whatever. I just don't know <laughs> yeah. what to actually do. So she comes home. She's upset. And typically, you know, um, with our kids, if they start something, we don't necessarily let them quit, right? Like all my kids tried different sports, hated it after week one, but we were like, nope, you're finishing the season. Right. With jobs, same thing. Okay, you can quit once you find a replacement job. But in this instance, we basically threw our own little thing out of the window <laughs> and said, you know what, don't go back there. <laughs> Screw them because they're just jerking you around. You're 16 and you shouldn't have to put up with this. So right. I she mean, lasted a week, I think. <laughs> yeah, and, and when you're younger, I'm I'm – only guessing that maybe her managers weren't, you know, seasoned managers either. Um, right. But shame on Hannah. She had an opportunity there to cut school that I would have taken in a <laughs> heartbeat. Right. If any boss of mine would have said, gee, we'd like to have you in here at noon, that, that'd be all the information I needed. That's right. the, the, the motivation for me to cut school. Oh, yeah, no doubt. Well, in fact, I think we even talked about this on a previous episode when we worked there at the steakhouse. My senior year in high school, I was done with classes by the end of fourth period. So I got my dad to sign this paper that said I could leave because I had a job. Right. Right. And, uh, and they would put me on the schedule at like noon or one o'clock. So it was great. You oh know, yeah. I just uh, yeah. went in, did the classes I had to take. I had plenty of credits to graduate and, and you know, that was that. Yeah. It, it's, it's different. Uh, I think when you're early in your career and, and I spoke about this, you know, when we first started off this episode early in your career, you know, you see things and you're just like, oh my gosh, I can't believe how bad it is. But the lens of time kind of smooths that out. And I do have a situation I remember when I very first started in the financial industry. And again, to be fair, I was probably 22 years old and the manager of this place was probably 24. So right, it's not right. like they were dealing with a lifetime of uh, uh, of history, experience, and know-how. So I remember I worked in a, in a call center where we would take calls about some people's credit card accounts. And so, you know, there's just, you're on the phone from 8 a.m. until 5 p.m. And there is absolutely, in fact, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. if you'd been there for a while. This was a 24-hour call center. So they were very tight with their breaks and lunches. Things were just very stringent because we always had more calls than we could handle. Well, um, I had just gotten out of training, was assigned to my team, probably been there for a couple months. And then other people in my training class went to, you know, other teams. And when we had a break that happened to be together, one of my team members said, oh, my gosh, my my new team member, my new team manager, uh, they just put together this thing that I don't know how this is going to go. I go, what do you mean? Yeah. Are you guys, do you guys have this too, the demerit system? And I said, what are you talking about? Now, I have to preface this by saying I had just finished going to school where I got my uh, bachelor's degree in business management and marketing. So I was educated up to my eyeballs in management, management theory, things to do, things not to do. And then I was going into an area where these people always promoted from within. And a lot of the people they promoted didn't necessarily have that background of going to management classes. And this was one of those scenarios. Not that I think that's necessary, but certainly it's just a different layer of right, influence right. you have in making decisions. And I said, what is this demerit system you're talking about? They said, well, Sean, their boss, put together the demerit system and passed out this piece of paper and they handed it and I'm handed it to me. I'm telling you, it was like a Michael Scott moment <laughs> out of the office. Right. I'm looking at this sheet of paper and it says, you know, uh, here's different ways you will receive demerits. And one of them was talking back to me. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> that was like one of the first ones. And I went, is this a joke? No, 100% serious. Other ones were, if you're late, uh, if you're not back on time from uh, breaks or lunches, if you're not on time for meetings, we're in a call center. You don't, 
you know, you don't you can't have control any it. control right. over a customer you're speaking to that you right. need to take care of. So all these people were completely stressed out. And I said, are you sure this is real? Because it was so bad that it seemed like it was, it was like a prank. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I was like, is it April 1st? Like, what is this? So uh, it was, there was a scenario where, you know, every quarter or so they would take the VP of this area and he would ask these team managers like, hey, get me one or two people from your team. I want to bring them in and just do a focus group. Well, it had been a, you know, three or four weeks since the demerit system was put in place in this one team and people were hating life. <laughs> um, so I, of course, get invited to this meeting where I get to ask questions and share my things. So, of course, because I'm a jerk, I raised my hand and the guy, Bob, who was the VP, said, yeah, what's up? And I said, are we rolling out the demerit system to everyone? <laughs> <laughs> and he goes, what the hell are you talking about? Right. What, what demerit system? And I said, well, uh, uh, at least on one of the teams, there's a demerit system where you get so many demerits. And it was actually written in the paper. If you get so many demerits, it's going to impact your pay. Oh, wow. So it was a pretty big deal. Well, this guy, Bob, um, he, he didn't mince words. He was like, Bring me in this guy, Craig, whatever his name, this this Sean's guy's manager, marches him in in front of 20 agents. Now I feel bad. Oh, no. <laughs> and he goes, what is this demerit system? And Craig, of course, is like, I don't know what the hell you're talking about. Because this Sean guy did this all on his own. Right. And he goes, I don't know what you're talking about. He goes, you better go find out what this demerit system is. And if it exists, it doesn't exist in 10 minutes or else I'm giving it to you. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> So now I'm That's thinking, awesome. oh, no, my name's going to be attached right, to, right. you know, uh, dropping a dime on this. Well, of course, after the meeting, I go to lunch that day and people were like, oh, they ran around collecting all that paperwork today. I wonder what happened. And I just whistled past the graveyard. But, yeah, in hindsight, you know, you think about that. This Sean guy probably 100 percent thought this was a great idea right, to right. garner some control and some discipline of his team. His heart was probably in the right spot. But my God, was that a stupid move. Right. And he probably even worked in a situation where they had a demerit system like that. But yeah, you know, so he thought, like you said, oh, I'm going to sh I'm going to show him like I'm going to have the best team. I'm going to have this yeah. system that's going to, you know, really get people motivated to work. Well, it had the complete opposite. Obviously. Yeah, they absolutely hated him. And, and you know, I've never been a proponent that you need to get people with college degrees to work for you or anything like that. And this person actually had a college degree, but it was in something complete. It was like fashion. You right, know, right. it was completely different. Um, but that's just one of those human natures. I mean, I, I wouldn't want to be treated that way. So I wouldn't treat someone that way. Right. And I think that's where a lot of these boss stories go wrong. Exactly. Well, here's one. Um, I saw this on com and it kind of goes with um you know what you're saying maybe a boss he gets promoted um could be his first boss job and he's not really sure how to handle something um and so this person kind of wrote in and said that i work for a manager who was incapable of making a decision when i would go in his office and say i need a decision on this he would put on sunglasses and say these are my invisible glasses. They make you invisible. I can no longer see or hear you. Now get out of my office. <laughs> and he said he would just keep repeating that over and over till he just turned around and walked out. <laughs> oh my gosh. You almost wonder like, is that someone that just wanted to get fired? Right. And so, yeah. Or drive someone to violence. Right. So they're just sabotaging their own career because they hated it there. And they're just like, <laughs> so I want you to use that approach next time someone comes in. Yeah, your absolutely. That sounds just like me. Yeah. My invisible glasses. See, if I did something like that because people think that I'm funny and I'm a jokester, uh, people would just start throwing stuff at me and right, being right. like, oh, how can you see me if I'm supposed to be invisible? Right. Yeah, I, I, it would not work out well for me. I, you know, in, in doing the research, um, when you talk about the Michael Scott moments, invisible glasses would probably, you know, hit the writing board for that show. But uh, somebody wrote on CBS News, my boss heard there was an opening for a plant manager in our South American facility. To better prepare himself, he decided to attend Spanish classes on the company's time and at their expense. The only problem, the plants in Brazil where they speak Portuguese. <laughs> <laughs> that does sound like it could have been an office. That could have been right out of the office. office. Right, right. <laughs> well, then one that I saw that, um, and I don't know, this might actually classify as a good boss, not, not a, a horrible boss. Again, this was on Cosmo. Um, it said, um, I once worked for a woman who would send me to the liquor store. For her during my shift she would give me various retail bags to put the liquor in so i could sneak it in um you know whatever i bought for her. but on the plus side she offered to buy me whatever i wanted so 
you know, I have no idea where this person worked or their age, but there was a time, you know, you and I would have loved oh, that boss. Probably, I'd have taken right? that deal in a heartbeat. <laughs> Absolutely. I would have taken that deal. Yeah. I think times have changed because I don't think very many managers would uh, barter that deal. I don't think. Right. But I also think if you even address that to most kids today, they would drop a dime on you. Oh, for sure. Even for sure. that saying is so old. Drop it. <laughs> 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 I just aged myself with the saying. Um, something that I thought was kind of interesting too, uh, from going, oh, I'm sorry, from go banking rates.com. They said this person was hired as an educator to teach history lessons in school. However, the museum was underfunded. So one day the head of the museum asked her to rake leaves outside because they didn't have anyone else to do it. <laughs> so she wanted to be a team player. So she ended up raking leaves for four hours, which left her hands covered in blisters. Oh, wow. Can you imagine that? Well, that's actually kind of funny. The company I work for now, they're based out of Iowa. And prior to, I've worked with them now for six or seven years. So right when I started is when they moved into their new building. Well, the old building, um, downtown uh, Des Moines, Iowa, was an old house at one point. But it was so, mm -hmm. it had been converted to their office building. Well, they were saying to me, you know, lucky we're in our new building because in the wintertime, the, there's a lot of snow in, in Iowa. So whenever they had a new person, it was always the new person's job to go shovel the sidewalk out front. Oh, nice. <laughs> that wasn't really a directive of the boss. It was just kind of how the company did it, right? Oh, you're the new guy. Guess yeah. what? You okay. got to go shovel the sidewalk so customers can get in today. <laughs> <laughs> now, see, that doesn't sound bad because you're not going to shovel for four hours. Right. <laughs> and, and, you know, I am the person and I joke about this all the time. And thank goodness I pass this along to my kids. But if I'm doing a job, that's my job. I don't right. care if they say, hey, part of your job is to clean the toilets. Those toilets are going to be clean and they're that's going to right. be done well. And that's just how I've always operated. But if I was hired to teach kids and then they're like, oh, grab a rake. Oh, and just go ahead and do it all day. Yeah, I right, think right. I might have a problem with that one. <laughs> yeah, I might have a problem with that. And, uh, you know, when you talk about being asked to do things that are not part of your job and whether that makes someone a horrible boss, it does remind me, you know, I told you about working at that hotel where I worked in the gift shop. Mm -hmm. It wasn't part of the hotel whatsoever, um, but we would always have all kinds of events that would come through. And also, we would have um, airline pilots that would fly in to the main airport here, and they would stay at this hotel. Well, one day, I get a call from the front desk, and they're like, hey, are you busy? I'm in a one-person gift shop. Of course, I'm not busy. There's right. never <laughs> anything going on at this place. Um, and luckily, this was a very slow time. And I said, what's up? And they said, we're, we really need some help. And we can't think of anybody. Could you help us out? And I'm thinking, what in the world are these guys wanting me for? I'm like a 17-year-old kid. I said, what do you need? Um, these pilots want to go to the French market. Now, the French market was this, this place that had all these eateries and movie theaters. It was just like an outdoor mallsy thing. And I was like, okay. I'm thinking, they don't want me to put them in my Datsun B210 to do this today. You know, are you kidding me? And they said, uh, so do you think you could drive a limousine? <laughs> <laughs> so me being 17 and a dude, I'm like, absolutely. I can drive the hell out of that limousine. So I end up, uh, they come in, they gave me the keys and they were like, I'll bet you don't have a commercial driver's license. I'm like, I barely have my own license to drive there. And they thought about it. They were like, Okay, just there and back. I jumped in this limousine and it was stretch limo. And these pilots and a few flight attendants got on and I drove them up there. I think they tipped me 20 bucks, which at the time was just an enormous oh, yeah. amount of money. And at that moment, I'm rethinking my career. Like, what am I doing in this gift shop? You know, right. this is crazy. So I drove them up there, dropped them off, drove back. And then uh, they had me go pick them up as well. Did not get a tip on the way home. But 20 bucks for that, I thought that was crazy. Uh, I can tell you, I didn't mind being asked to do that. <laughs> and those right. limos drive pretty easy, right. I'll be honest. And, and, you know, and I knew you at that time, um, and this was way before cell phones. I can just imagine, um, you know, if that would have been in today's time and you would have had a cell phone, you certainly oh. would have called me up and said, Chris, I'll be at your house in 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Call all the guys, around. yeah. And you would have wanted to surprise me, right? Like, just look for my car. <laughs> and I would have waited for that old Datsun to roll up. And, or used to borrow your mom's citation. Remember oh, that? yeah. It was pretty sweet. Chick magnet. <laughs> right. And then you would have rolled up in the limo. We would have thought that was the coolest thing ever. <laughs> you know, uh, just thinking about 
again, some of these bad scenarios that you run into. I, I, I was reminded recently of, you know, in my professional career, I guess there was one situation where I had a horrible boss. And had I been a writer, I would have just said, nobody report this woman because I have to keep track of everything she does. I'm going to write a sitcom and it would have just written itself. Right. Uh, when I was at this bank, um, they needed to replace a manager and they brought this woman in to, and she was from out of town. They brought her in. They were like, oh, you're going to love her. She's fantastic. We'll just call her Sally. Okay. They're going to bring in Sally. She's fantastic. Um, she's got a lot of experience. So Sally comes in and it's weird. Immediately, we all got the vibe of she's not genuine. Like probably came off great during the interview, but not genuine person. Right. So all she did was have platitudes to talk about. She never really had any substance to her stories. It was all, you know, drink your milk and have eat your Ovaltine and blah, blah. Right. It was never anything that was really of substance. And she would never just sit down and go, oh. How was your weekend? I had a horrible weekend. You know, let me tell you crap that happened with me. She would never be real. She was all just right. BS. And so um, she used to come around all the time. And if there were people talking in a group, like if, if people were hanging around my little cubicle office, uh, she would come over and go, what are you guys talking about? As if we were talking about her, like she really thought we were talking about her. Right. And we're like, oh, hey, Sally. Uh, no, we were just catching up on stuff. Oh, I just thought I'd come over here because you guys are having a coffee clutch. And of course, right. you know, I'm talking about drop a dime today, so I shouldn't talk too much about this. <laughs> but I'm like, what the hell is a coffee clutch? You don't know what a coffee clutch So she, from then on, oh boy. She, then she decided she was going to take over. And she started sending out like instant messages to everybody like coffee clutch at Scott's at 10 o'clock. So now you feel like you're forced to buy your boss to get together. Right. And it was very awkward. And, but you know, people wanted to know her, but pretty soon she had these sayings that would drive people crazy. She would say, Oh, I'm open kimono. Now, if you saw this person, you would never want to see her with an open kimono. All right. <laughs> Not that I'm much to look at, but this person you would not want to see with the open kimono. And she had that saying, and uh, it was funny because she always would talk about, we need to build bridges, people. Remember, platitudes. Right. That's what she right. spoke in. Right. We need to be building bridges. So if you said, uh, if she goes, what's going on? Are you dealing with a problem? Oh, yeah, I was dealing with the chargeback area. And, you know, we can't seem to have this issue. And she's like, well, don't call it an issue. We need to build bridges. Like, thank you, but that's not helpful, you know? <laughs> right. right. So she started using this building bridges theme to where when she'd send emails, it would say, let's build bridges together. Oh, boy. So now everybody's like, oh, my God, they hired a crazy woman. <laughs> and so one day I came in and the place just smells awful of paint. And I'm like, what is going on? And one of my employees ran up to me and she goes, uh, Sally just hired painters. I was like, oh, I mean, because the building had been renovated two years prior. And then we had this giant long wall. And I see these painters. These weren't Don't like... These, these weren't like painters to paint the wall a different color. These were Rembrandt painters. These were people who were there stenciling because she was having them Don't build bridges. Oh, <laughs> and she had uh, this whole thing where she worked out with them where they were going to have the Golden Gate Bridge on this side, uh, some other major bridges, and how at the top it was going to say, we build bridges together. And I just went, I feel like I'm in the twilight zone. Like, right. this is crazy. Well, it happened to be, this was the week that her boss was coming in and he walked in and he was like, what the hell is this? And so, you know, you have to be very careful because you don't want to say, oh, my boss is a weirdo. Right. So you go, well, you know, Sally really likes us to build bridges with other departments. <laughs> so we're um, all about building bridges. And he looked around at each one of us and he was just like, holy shit, these guys have all been taken over. Their minds are gone. Right. And he goes, uh-uh. And I saw him walk over and tap one of the guys on the shoulder and was like, get out. <laughs> Scram. <laughs> Beat it. So it happened to be a really bad week for her because I think um, she'd only been there about four months and two weeks later she was gone. Yeah. 
But it was just more proof. She was not a genuine person. Right. I'm not quite sure if her experience led her to really lead teams like that. Right. And that's what I was going to ask. Maybe she just got in over her head and didn't really know how to yeah. do it. So she just was throwing out these little terms that she's heard. Yeah, she didn't know the, the basics of managing right. people. And I'm a little curious whether she knew about managing processes. Um, so it was just a, a really bad situation. And the worst part of it, I really think that that lady um, meant well. Right. But oh my gosh, was she disconnected from yep. the world? <laughs> so long story, but I guess there was one from my professional career that I did remember. So um, now that we've talked a lot about uh, horrible bosses, what have we learned today? Yeah, I think that um, we learned that if you need an eye transplant, it better not interfere with your work schedule. Absolutely. Uh, I think, you know, I also learned that it's important that if you're going to take a bereavement day, it, it pays to plan. Right. Absolutely. <laughs> All right. Well, hey, thanks, everybody. That about wraps it up for this episode. I'm Scott McLaughlin. And I'm Chris Kiernan. Saying, we'll see you at work. Thank you for listening to the Not in the Job Description podcast. If you have a story you'd like to share, or if you'd like to be a guest on our podcast, please let us know by sending us an email with a brief description of your story to stories at notinthejob.com.